This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Okay. Thanks very much uh, for the opportunity to give these lectures. So uh, the topic that I will be covering is uh, renormalization groups. The renormalization group and the various applications of it in diverse dimensions and the connections to supersymmetry, to string theory, to ADSFT, and all such subjects. Uh, there will be some parts that are advanced and some parts that are uh, much more basic, so that I understand the audience is quite mixed. It perhaps can fit everybody. Uh, and also, if there are any questions, of course, uh, the whole point is that you could stop me, and probably your questions are of interest to others in the audience, too. So. We'll, everybody would benefit if you stop me as frequently as you want and ask any question that you want. So the, the outline is that there will be, I'll start from some introduction. Uh, so I'll cover a few topics. In the introduction, I will explain why the renormalization group is a useful concept, what kind of applications uh, it may have, and what branches of physics is it connected to. So in addition, of course, to high energy physics. So there will be some introduction and general quantum field theory uh, that will be quite basic, but there might be some points of view that are not so familiar. Uh, and then I will cover uh, some more advanced and more recent topics. Uh, Two-dimensional two quantum field theories, uh, three-dimensional quantum field theories, and four-dimensional quantum field theories. So this is the plan to cover all of these uh, rec recent and more and less recent advances in two, three, and four dimensional quantum field theories and some lessons that we've learned about renormalization group flows. <coughs> okay, so let us, uh, so of course in each one of them there will be more, more and less advanced uh, aspects and some, some, some I will not cover that much because they are probably too much for six hours, but uh, there are some, I should say that there are some quite extensive lecture notes that I uh, wrote up uh, for this uh, summer school. And you can find them, I think, online. They were uploaded a, few, a day ago or maybe even to today in the morning. So they're quite extensive and they may contain at least everything I'm going to say and maybe even more. Okay, so let's start from the introduction. So there are, so uh, when one is, the, the, the main idea of the renormalization group is that they so the main idea of the renormalization group is that uh, if there are some degrees of freedom that are slow uh, and some other degrees of freedom that are fast, then one is uh, allowed in some consistent approximation to forget about the slow degrees of freedom. So to forget about the slow degrees of freedom, that's one way of thinking about uh, the renormalization group. Uh, there are other formulations which are in some sense equivalent. And to show that this is a powerful idea, it's always good to have in mind one example where uh, one can derive a surprisingly strong result from a, a very simple argument or a very simple idea. And that kind of exhibits the power of this idea. And of course, it, there will be other applications which are even more impressive. Mm -hmm. So one very simple example in which you can see the power of the renormalization group is in a simple quantum mechanical problem. Uh, quantum mechanics is not usually a field in which we apply uh, ideas that you think are more Wilsonian, Wilsonian ideas. But even, even in quantum mechanics, there are interesting applications. So this is a, let me just give a simple example. This is a very elementary example in quantum mechanics. So of an application of the Wilsonian ideas in quantum mechanics. So suppose you are given the following system, a Hamiltonian of two degrees of freedom. You may have seen this example before if you studied matrix theory, for example. But for those of you who have not seen this example before, I will review it. So we have two degrees of freedom, x and y. And they have just canonical kinetic terms. And this is just quantum mechanics. So it's d over dx squared plus d over dy squared. And then the potential has some coupling constant lambda. And it looks like x squared, y squared. 
So these kind of Hamiltonians appear very commonly in matrix theory and other, and other applications. And one central question about such Hamiltonians is whether they have a discrete or a continuous spectrum. So if you, so the potential, uh, the potential if you try to plot it in the xy plane, so I can't quite, I can't quite draw it three dimensionally, but you see that there are flat directions. So when x, uh, when x is zero or y is zero, you see that there are flat directions. So this potential is not everywhere bounded. Uh, sorry, it's not everywhere going to infinity. So it's not manifestly a discrete spectrum. There are some flat directions. So there are flat directions. So at least a classical, classically, a particle could escape along the x direction or the y direction to infinity. So a classical particle could escape. Now, for various applications, one would be one is interested in the question of whether quantum mechanically a particle can escape, or more precisely, whether the spectrum is discrete or not. So, but in quantum mechanics, it's not a priori clear whether the spectrum is discrete or continuous. So, so is the spectrum continuous? Okay, so this, if you try, if you try to address this, this question using the tools of differential equations and harmonic analysis, you would try to understand if the eigenvalues are discrete or continuous. It would not be very easy to find the answer, albeit probably not impossible. But the renormalization group provides a conceptual framework that helps, at least in this specific context, answer, answer the question very easily. <coughs> so what's the central idea? So you, you, could, you could imagine that some particle escaped along the x or the y direction. So, so the idea is that we assume that part, some particle could escape along the x direction. Let me just put some factors here to make. So in the notes, all the factors are correct. So, so maybe in the lectures, I would not keep all the factors straight. It would be just messy. Are there any? OK. So um, if a particle like goes in the x, suppose it goes in the x direction very far, and y is still 0. So suppose somehow, suppose somehow we have x, which is very, very large in absolute value, and y is 0. So that's one of our flat directions. Now, there was, so it, the spectrum uh, of oscill small oscillations around some point here very far on the x-axis is that uh, the y oscillator is very, very heavy. So the, frequency, the effective frequency of the y oscillator is very large when you're at large x. So the frequency of the y oscillator is very large. So that means that it's a heavy degree of freedom, and it would not fluctuate too much for a large enough x. So we can integrate it out. How do we integrate it out? We say that since this degree of freedom is very heavy, it settles at its ground state. So this degree of freedom settles at its ground state. And the energy, of course, is the well-known uh, frequency over 2. The frequency of this oscillator is a, let's put a square so that it's nicer. The frequency of this oscillator is lambda times x. So the energy of the ground state of the y oscillator is a, a half of a, not worrying about factors, let's remove the half, it's lambda times x. Okay, so the ground state energy of the y oscillator is just lambda times x because of the gr non-zero ground state energy of a harmonic oscillator in quantum mechanics. And so you find effect, an effective Hamiltonian uh, which is a, in which you, re you remove the y coordinate altogether and you remain with just the x degree of freedom, which is light, because it's moving on a flat direction. So the effective Hamiltonian, after you've integrated out the y degree of freedom, is p x squared plus lambda x. Okay? And that, if we plot it, so this is the potential, this is x, 
So this, this calculation is only valid for large enough x. And there are many exercises in the notes online. One of the exercises is to carry out this procedure systematically to higher orders in, uh, in, in 1 over x. But at least at large enough x, we see that the potential looks like an absolute value. And there will be some corrections that you could compute systematically in some perturbation theory that, makes, that, makes, that, that is well defined. And so you see that the spectrum is gapped. So it's discrete. The flat directions, we would say technically that the flat directions are lifted. So even though they exist classically, they're lifted quantum mechanically. And you would say that this is a one loop computation. So this is quantum mechanics, but technically this is more or less the same as doing a one loop computation in quantum field theory and seeing if some flat direction is lifted or not. So that's an example of a sort of a killer application of the renormalization group ideas, which allows you to solve a complicated problem with very little effort. OK, now let's get to quantum field theory. So this will be just some very general remarks about uh, when quantum field theory is relevant for uh, actual physics and uh, what kind of branches of physics you expect, in what kind of branches of physics you expect to encounter quantum field theory. So, so the, the, basic, the basic starting point is that you have some lattice in which uh, there are some points, okay? And let's say that the distance between uh, points is little a, and the size of the lattice is capital L. So we have a lattice of size L and lattice facing A. And now suppose you, pro you provide some Hamiltonian or some prescription for computing correlation some, some prescription for computing correlation functions between degrees of freedom on this lattice. So there will be some local operators that sit at various points on the lattice, and you could compute their correlation functions. That's, uh, that could be any spin system if you want, and it may not even be lo it may not even have to be local, a local uh, a nearest neighbor interaction type spin system. So uh, you can try to compute the average of the product of some operators on this lattice. These O's could be some products of the spin degree of freedom or any other interesting degree, any, any other interesting object that you can form. And well, generally, you expect that this will decay as the distances increase. The reason that you expect this to decay as the distances increase is that you expect that uh, each I, well, in sufficiently nice systems, each guy would just talk to its neighbors, not necessarily just the immediate neighbors, but there will be some neighborhood with, of other lattice points with which it would communicate, and then the correlations would decay. So the average product would eventually decay to zero. So the answer that one usually takes for this is that there will be some, dif there will be some distance over some a parameter that is called xi, and xi is called the correlation lens. So this can be defined for any lattice, essentially any lattice system. Okay. Can you say again? Yes, sorry. So there may be power laws that multiply this exponent and so on, but qualitatively this is what you expect. So there is some correlation lens that is emergent out of your Hamiltonian or prescription for how to compute averages. Now, in most cases, what do you expect? You expect that this correlation lens would be maybe a few times A. It would be of the order of the lattice spacing. You don't expect, unless you do some, in, unless you intervene in some very fine-tuned way, fine -tuned way, you don't expect that the correlations would extend over macroscopic distances. If you just take a generic Hamiltonian with generic couplings, you expect that correlations will be of the order of the lattice spacing. Now, quantum field theory arises precisely when this is not the case. And this happens, of course, in many interesting systems, some of which I will mention. So, when, when, when the correlation lens exceeds A, when and if, so you have to tune the coupling constants for this to happen. 
or tune the temperature or whatever. You have to tune something for this to be true. But when this is true, then uh, you can essentially forget about the lattice. So there's an interest when this is true, then there's an interesting structure which extends over scales that are much larger than the lattice spacing. There is an interesting structure. There is an interesting structure that extends much beyond the fine lattice spacing details that is essentially oblivious to the lattice. So there, the interesting stru structure that is essentially oblivious to the lattice. And in this case, general physical intuition would suggest that you should be able to replace the lattice theory by a continuum theory. And that is when quantum field theory arises. So qu qu quantum field theory arises when there is some lattice theory which sits near a critical point. When the correlation lens goes to infinity strictly, so the exponent disappears and all the correlations are power laws, then we get a quantum field theory at its conformal phase or scale invariant phase. So this is the extreme version of quantum field theory where it's completely void of any coupling constants, which are dimensionful. OK, so this is the usual construction of quantum field theory in the language of a, you know, that you imagine that there is some system which evolves in time, and there is some lattice, and you may tune the coupling constant such that it reaches some kind of fixed point, or, the, or some kind of, some kind, some, some kind of a, a continuum theory. But this, this, this kind of description, so this description for how quantum field theory emerges uh, shows that quantum field theory may be connected to fundamental physics. So this description uh, shows that quantum field theory may be connected to fundamental physics because we believe that at least, well, we see that what we see doesn't have any finer structure, at least the space that we see doesn't have any finer structure, so it's natural to use this continuum formulation. So quantum field theory may be related, should, should be, should be describe, describing the universe, uh, or at least uh, as, as far as we ignore gravity, because as you know, gravity introduces lots of other problems. And it's also very, very natural for spin systems. Okay, so this is why quantum field theory appears in quantum phase transitions, or spin systems, very, very often. So this description shows that quantum field theory is related to high energy physics, because we don't expect any kind of finer grained, uh, maybe lattice structure of space time, at least not at the energy scales that quantum field theory is supposed to describe. So this is high energy physics. But it's also, from this description, you can also see that spin systems which are tuned uh, may be very well described by quantum field theory. So this will be quantum phase transitions. So in both cases, quantum, so quantum field theory describes two quantum phenomena, two kinds of quantum phenomena. One is high energy physics, which is a quantum world, and the other is quantum phase transitions, in which you take some spin system and you, it's quantum mechanical, and you tune the coupling constant such that it goes berserk or it develops infinite correlation lengths. Now, uh, one of the reasons that quantum field theory is so interesting and so omnipresent is that it also describes classical systems and uh, this is something that I would like to emphasize now. So, so this, this presentation of quantum field theory is very natural for these two kinds of physical systems. But even classical physics, some problems in classical physics, uh, are described by quantum field theory. And that's a little bit more surprising. And this is one of the reasons to be interested in quantum field theory. It describes really a very vast array of physical phenomena. So. So, but also classical problems, problems in classical physics can be mathematically described by quantum field theory, even though they are not quantum. 
I will now discuss two kinds of classical problems that are descri described by quantum filter just to motivate uh, the whole idea. And uh, in both renormalization group, the renormalization group plays a pivotal role. So the first one is classical statistical systems. So this is just StatMech, classical statistical systems. So in classical statistical systems, what you are instructed to do is to compute the partition function. And how do you compute the partition function? One way of doing that is to sum over the phase space. So you're given some system uh, with coordinates and momenta. And you're supposed to sum over the whole phase space e to the minus h of p and q over the temperature where h is the Hamiltonian as a function of the coordinate and momenta. So that is a one situation which is very important. This is one kind of problem that people in classical statistical mechanics investigate. Now, if the number of coordinates and momenta is very large, uh, you can just think about it as an integral over all the possible momenta and all the possible coordinates of e to the minus h p q over t. OK, so you can just integrate over all the possible momenta and all the possible coordinates where this kind of integration means that it's a product of all, all the momenta of the system. Now, another assumption that you make is that the Hamiltonian is quadratic in momentum. So HPQ is, uh, for example, P squared, where you sum over all the particles plus some function of the QI. So if the Hamiltonian is indeed quadratic in momenta, which is uh, something that you encounter of course, uh, very often, then you can perform the integral over momenta straightforwardly. It doesn't do anything, it's just a Gaussian integral. And you remain with an integral over the coordinates of some function that looks like this, just the potential. So this is after integrating over the momenta. This is just uh, still just classical physics. And now, in many systems, the potential itself for the coordinates would take a form which is more or less the following. So in many systems that you could imagine, the potential as a function of the coordinates of the system would uh, be something of this sort. So for example, you could imagine that the coordinates sit on some lattice and uh, it's labeled by some integers, and uh, the potential depends on whether two nearby coordinates are correlated or not. So there could be a term like this and many others. So in the continuum description where there are many coordinates and so on, this would just become a derivative, and the uh, other terms may, so for example, you could imagine that it's like this, some function of the qi squared, let's say, or just the qi. So you could write it like this, and then in the continuum limit of the statistical classical system, this would just become the derivative, and this would become the potential, and you could, for example, find a bona fide quantum field theory in this limit. And so this could lead, for example, to a quantum field theory of the following sort, d phi e to the minus del phi squared plus some potential for phi. And you integrate over the phase. Okay, so such, so this could be the natural limit, the natural continuum limit of a simple classical system, and you get a pass integral even though there is nothing, quant nothing quantum at the outset. You get a quantum filter. Quantum filter in this case just describes a perfectly good classical system. And that is the this is the correspondence between statistical systems and quantum filter. This is a well-known correspondence that many statistical systems are described by Euclidean quantum filtering. So just to emphasize, in this case, you expect to get Euclidean quantum filtering. Well, in these two situations, it's more natural to think about quantum filtering in Minkowski space, where there is time and some evolution. In this case, you get naturally Euclidean quantum filtering. Okay, so this is one more situation in which quantum filtering appears and is very useful. And now I'll just mention the final uh, one more, one more uh, situation 
or physical realization of some systems in which quantum filter appears naturally. And this is in uh, random process, stochastic processes. So uh, stochastic processes, which are again uh, completely classical systems, uh, they can be mapped to quantum field theory in some crude way that is not very dissimilar from this. So let's, let's take an example of uh, just the simplest possible system that is stochastic and I'll show you how it's mapped to quantum field theory. So the, system, the simplest uh, thing that you can imagine is that uh, you have some particle uh, with some velocity and uh, there is some friction, uh, which is constant friction that is proportional to the velocity of the particle. And this guy is being bombarded uh, more or less randomly for, from all directions. That's kind of Brownian motion, with which is damped by friction. Okay, so the equation that will describe that is just dv over dt. And here we will put the mass of the particle, that's the, acceler the acceleration. And then there will be some positive coefficient alpha, which is the friction that acts on the particle. You could think about it as a particle in some medium, such as liquid. So there is some friction, and it's also being constantly bombarded by some other microscopic particles from the liquid. So there will be some uh, force, and this is the key. So there is some force, which is uh, random. You, this is a phenological model uh, for some collisions that you don't know how to take account of microscopically. So you just model them by a random force. So this is a random force. So, I, so what you have to specify are the statistical properties of this random force. So you could, for example, demand that this force averages to zero. So the average force is zero. And for example, that the force at time t1 and the force at time t2 are independent. So there is a delta function. So that, that would guarantee that the system doesn't care what it did 100 years ago. It just cares about what it did uh, infinitesimally uh, in the past. OK, so you could spe specify these kind of rules, and you could try to solve this problem. This is called, of course, the Langevin equations. The Langevin equation, and it's just the simplest possible stochastic equation. It can be generalized, generalized very much in many directions. So how does quantum field theory appear in this context? So you could compute, you could try to compute correlations of, let's say, the velocity at time t1 and the velocity at time t2. So for this, is for, this, is, this would be, for example, an interesting question to ask. Since there is this random force, the velocities would be correlated in some way. This can be computed. Now, the main assertion of stochastic quantization uh, is that uh, if you take these times to be equal, and if you send the time to infinity, and you assume that the system reaches some equilibrium eventually, this is described by uh, quantum field theory, Euclidean quantum field theory. So these correlation functions can be computed by Euclidean quantum field theory. So they can be computed by some averages in some Euclidean action that you need to find. How do you find this action? So for the Langevin equation, uh, the answer is, of course, known. Uh, the action that you need to use in that case is just dt. Sorry, the action that you need to use in that case is just v squared. So uh, this velocity correlations, for example, v to the n, would be given by dv, v to the n, e to the minus v squared, when time goes to infinity. So this is the infinite time, which is, of course, the Boltzmann distribution. So this is just the, Bolt the Maxwell distribution of velocities. So at inf at after infinite time, the system reaches some equilibrium in which it becomes thermalized. And these correlation functions at infinite time can be computed against the Maxwell distribution of velocities. But of course, this is, a just, uh, this is the most trivial realization of a much more general story in which you take some systems which are driven by random forces and you assume that at infinity they reach some kind of equilibrium 
and uh, the analog of the Maxwell distribution is supposed to be described by some Euclidean quantum field theory that you may or may not be able to find depending on the situation. Usually, for some class of uh, stochastic problems, it's not hard to find, like in this case, but in other cases, it may be very hard to find. So you see that the quantum field theory appears in a variety of situations, uh, ranging from like fundamental physics to stochastic problems, which are purely phenological. And so uh, it's worth trying to understand what we can say about quantum field theory. So let me just uh, uh, outline the questions that I would like to tr address, the kind of questions that I would like to address about quantum field theory. So are there any questions about the introduction? Uh, well, uh, this example, uh, th I've given one example in which uh, you could see that there is a parametric separation between the x oscillator and the y oscillator, whereby one has a huge frequency, and so it's very hard to excite, and one has essentially zero frequency, so it's very easy to excite. So in that case, the one that has a huge frequency would be very, very slow, in the sense that it's very hard to excite it out of its ground state while the one that has zero frequency would be all over the place. Okay. So you, you need some parametric separation, and then you can use uh, judiciously this kind of ideas of integrating out the, fast, the, <coughs> the slow degrees of freedom. Okay, so the situation, the general situation that I would like to address is that we have some, CF, some conformal field theory. That's the extreme case of quantum field theory where the correlation length is not just bigger than the lattice spacing, but it's actually infinite. We will discuss also the question of whether all such systems have to be conformal. That will be something that I will discuss in detail. And then we imagine that we add some perturbation. So the correlation length is not really infinite anymore. The system reorganizes itself. And the endpoint may be another new conformal field theory in the infrared, CFT. CFT is conformal field theory that you must have heard a lot about from Leonardo. And uh, the, there are several questions uh, you can ask about this general picture. So Leonardo focused just about the inner stru mathematical structure of conformal field theories, but in all of these physical realizations, what you find is that they are perturbed in some way, and they reorganize themselves, and sometimes they lead to new conformal field theories, which may, in particular, be, all, be empty. So these conformal field theories in the infrared may be trivial or empty, and that's what happens in many systems, but in some systems, they are also non-trivial. So that leads to lots of questions. Uh, and uh, the answer to these questions, answers to these questions would be useful for all of these kind of physical problems in which quantum field theory appears. So one can ask, for example, are there constraints? So can we, for example, perturb one, CF, one given conformal field theory and get to any other conformal field theory? So are there constraints? That, that would be, of course, if, if there are useful constraints, that would be, of course, very nice because uh, we would know that some perturbations cannot lead you to some class of phases of matter or may lead you to other, class, other phases of matter and so on. So you can ask whether there are interesting constraints on this uh, general picture. Then you could ask, uh, for example, uh, when the correlation length is infinite, then uh, you lose all the mass scales of the problem. So there is, no, there is no natural mass scale in the lattice model anymore. All the correlations are infinite, and everything is just a power law. This is the situation in which you expect to encounter conformal field theories, because as you know, there are no exponentials in conformal field theories, just power laws, like I assume Leonardo explained. But is it really true that it has to be a conformal field theory? Can it be that uh, the correlation length would be infinite, there would be just power laws, but it would not be invariant under the full conformal group, just under a subset, 
do, so do we have to have the full conformal group? So as you know, the conformal group is in d dimensions is the uh, uh, so s o let's say d comma two let's in Minkowski space or if, okay let's do Euclidean space in Euclidean space it would be a, a this kind of thing or in Minkowski space never mind where this is the number of uh, space time uh, dimensions <coughs> so that would be the answer in Minkowski space but you know how to continue it. So the question is whether you must have this group or not. Can we have some subset of this group and still have just power laws? That's a fundamental question about, uh, for example, in the context of statistical systems, this is an imp extremely important question because as you know, the whole theory of phase transitions or this theory is where the correlation lens becomes infinite has been developed by Landau and he developed, he found many constraints on uh, phase transitions by using just a subgroup of the conformal group. So Landau uh, just used uh, the fact that the, sy the, sy the systems are invariant under total rescaling. But the fact that you have these bigger groups imposes much more severe constraints on uh, correlation functions and, the pro and, pr and other properties of the uh, phase transitions. So if you want to understand the co constraints on second order phase transitions, uh, you need to know whether the symmetry group has to be enhanced compared to what Landau did or not. Of course, for example, such enhancements of symmetry, for example, happen in the hydrogen atom where SO3 is enhanced to SO4, and we know this has very useful consequences uh, or very simplifying consequences for the dynamics of the system. So it would be very nice to know if all the second order phase transitions have to be in this class. So it's a very fundamental question about uh, it's a very basic question about statistical physics and also it's very important in high energy physics and so on. So that's another kind of thing you would like to know. Um, you would like to understand what's the, ge the geometry in the space of all the possible theories and all the possible renormalization group flows. Uh, there is, of course, the connection to quantum gravity. Such a picture has an avatar using ADS-15 where it describes some uh, process in quantum gravity. and uh, you could try to ask what are, so suppose you find interesting constraints, interesting facts about the geometry of these kind of things, uh, you would like to know what does that imply about quantum gravity, so it's connected to string theory and so on. And of course, uh, uh, one big question that I won't be able to say much about is uh, how to generalize uh, all these kind of lessons that one can learn to non-equilibrium physics. Uh, all of these uh, manifestations of quantum field theory that I described are really very useful only in equilibrium physics. When you're very far from equilibrium, it's very hard to use quantum field theory or the ideas of renormalization. So that's just an open question that I wanted to mention. Okay, so this is the end of the introduction. Now we'll get to something much more concrete of the two-dimensional models, Model quantum field theory in two dimensions. So in two dimensions, one of the benefits is that many of these questions can be actually answered. And you will see that one can say a lot about whether the symmetry needs to be enhanced, uh, whether second order phase transitions need to obey these enhanced symmetries that Landau did not take into account in his theory, and so on and so forth. And some of these things are not yet possible uh, to concretely resolve in higher dimensions. Okay, so two dimensions. So this is an, a topic that will take me more, I mean, more than an hour, maybe even two to cover. And uh, there are many aspects. So let me just uh, start with an outline of what I'm going to discuss. Now it will be much more precise and less vague than the introduction. So there are several topics that uh, we will discuss. One of them is the question of symmetry enhancement at the second order phase transitions, or CFTs. So symmetry enhancement, uh, symmetry enhancement uh, for theories which are scale invariant. For theories that are just scale invariant. Uh, 
So we will find that any two-dimensional model which obeys scale transformation invariance, in fact, obeys a much bigger group, an infinite group. So that will be one central uh, thing that I want to say. This is an old result, which is a few decades old. And let, uh, there will be also uh, many new results that I will describe. So another old result is that there are interesting constraints on CFT IR. So not, not if you... <coughs> So if you deform a given conformal filter by an arbitrary perturbation, not every other uh, conformal filter can be reached. There are interesting geometric, there are interesting constraints on this conformal filter, which you can also interpret geometrically. This is another old, another old result, and I will review these two results uh, because the tools will be important in much more recent developments in higher dimensions. So I will review these two results in detail, and I will also get to some more uh, modern results about entanglement entropy. The, it, it appears that these two facts are closely related to the entanglement entropy of the vacuum. And the, the, so there is some close relation between these results and entanglement entropy. That's much more recent development. And uh, I will also explain that in detail. And then we'll go to higher dimensions where one can say less, but the tools are still useful and one can say some interesting things. So these are the topics that I want to cover about two-dimensional filters. And uh, so let's uh, start from some uh, basic, basic observations. Are there any questions about the outline? Okay, so the object which uh, one, the, the object which gives you lots of mileage in two dimensions is the correlation function uh, of the energy momentum tensor with itself. So by studying this general correlation function of the energy momentum tensor with itself, one can find, one gets lots, lots of mileage, as you will see. So the energy momentum tensor satisfies the conservation equation in position space. And uh, if the theory, and we'll discuss also what are the conditions for the theory to be, to be scale invariant or conformal. But this is an equation that you would like to impose. So you want, you, what you need to do is to find all the possible terms that you can write on the right hand side, which are consistent with the fact that the two energy momentum tensors are the same. So you can exchange them. So the indices mu, nu, and rho and sigma can be exchanged. And also, of course, it's symmetric. So the indices uh, mu and nu and rho and sigma are separately symmetric, and uh, this conservation equation. So in, in, in the most general case, in any number of dimensions, this is not just in two dimensions, there are two tensors that can appear on the right hand side. So let me write them down. and the parentheses, sorry for that. This, this is called, this would be called a G of Q squared. So there is some tensor structure that multiplies the function G. And then there is another tensor structure that exists, which is Q mu Q rho minus Q squared eta mu rho. And then there is Q nu Q sigma minus eta nu sigma Q squared plus rho exchanged with sigma. And that one will have a factor of a half. And there will be some function f. OK, so this is the most general decomposition of the two-point function of the energy momentum tensor in any number of dimensions. You can uh, convince yourself that there are no other terms that you can write, which we would be consistent with all the requirements that I listed before. Now there is something magical that happens in two dimensions, and that's uh, one of the exercises in the notes. Uh, it appears in two dimensions 
in two dimensions there is a small miracle that these two tensor structures are not independent. And in fact, you can trace back all the mileage that you can make out of this two-point function to the fact that these two tensor structures are not independent in two dimensions. So F and G are not independent. This is an exercise, which an interesting exercise for you to do. I will keep using F and G as if they are independent, uh, but, it, but they are not independent. Secretly, these two tensor structures are the same. Okay, so in two dimensions, F and G are not independent. That's a crucial fact, but I will keep using F and G as if they are independent. So now, <coughs> you'll I, I will show you that just from that, one can immediately uh, derive extremely powerful constraints. So let us assume that the system is scale invariant. Okay. okay. So let's assume, let's assume that our system is scale invariant. Scale invariant. So the system doesn't have any inherent mass scale, and these functions f and g don't depend on any masses. They just depend on momenta. Okay, that's the meaning of the assumption that the system doesn't have any scale. So then we can fix the functions f and g just from dimensional analysis. So uh, the, the, the dimension of the energy momentum tensor in real space is two. So in momentum space, it's dimensionless. Of course, I have omitted the delta function, the usual delta function that appears in momentum space. So these objects have to have dimension, this whole object has to have dimension two because there is a delta function that I omitted. That means that f has to be something like some coefficient b, a real number b over q squared because the whole thing has to have dimension two. And the function g has to be some other coefficient, let's call it d over q squared. This is a consequence of scale invariance, of the fact that there are no mass scales in the system. Now, one could raise a question, uh, whether I'm cheating, why am I not including logarithms? So you could try to include some lo logarithm. Uh, the short answer is that a logarithm needs a scale to make it, uh, well, to make it sensible, and uh, one can convince oneself that there is no way to do that in this case. So these are really the only possibilities if you require scale invariance. Now, this leads to an amazing consequence, more or less without any further work. So one can trace over the indices mu and u and rho and sigma and compute t mu mu with at momentum q with t mu nu at momentum minus q. So I'm just tracing the indices mu and u and rho and sigma and I'm plugging these uh, results. So what one finds is uh, that a... Uh, this two-point function is equal to b plus d times q squared. Okay, this is something that one finds straightforwardly by just tracing over the indices mu and u. Now, one can transform this back to position space. This is a polynomial in momentum. The Fourier transform of a polynomial in momentum is a delta function in position space. So this means the following thing, that t mu mu at x and t nu nu at zero is zero for as long as x is not equal to zero. W more precisely, it would be useful to write the delta function. Let me just write the full answer. So it's proportional to b plus d times box of a two-dimensional delta function of x. So in particular, it vanishes when x is not zero. Okay, why does this, the, now the next step is that there is something uh, which is called the Riesz-Lida theorem, which has the following thing. If a two-point function in the unitary quantum field theory vanishes, a two-point function of, of an operator and its Hermitian conjugate, if a two-point function of an operator and its Hermitian, with its Hermitian conjugate vanishes, so this is the Riesz-Lida theorem, which says that if OO dagger vanishes, when x is not equal to zero, then the operator O is itself a vanishing operator in unitary theories. This is only true in unitary theories. Uh, 
So x, we assume that x is non-zero and we assume unitarity. Okay, this is uh, something that is intuitively uh, almost obvious. Uh, the reason is that you can insert a complete set of states between O dagger and O. So you see that O does not create anything from the vacuum. It's or every, anything that O creates from the vacuum is orthogonal to any physical state. So that all more or less uh, is tantamount to saying that O is trivial. And uh, <coughs> therefore, uh, one finds from this completely straightforward manipulation that the trace of the energy momentum tensor needs to be zero in any scale invariant theory. If the trace of the energy momentum is zero, in, is zero then we have the full conformal group, not just scale invariance. So this means, this is of course a familiar condition for conformal invariance. So this means that we have the full conformal group. which in two dimensions is a SL to C. Okay, so uh, you see that there is an extremely power co powerful consequence of this just two point function, completely straightforward analysis. And you immediately get that any system which is scaling variant must obey the full conformal group. And in fact, in two dimensions, the conformal group is, as you know, enhanced to the Virasor group, and it leads to very stringent constraints on what these theories can be. And this is, of course, very useful in studying phase transitions in two dimensions. <coughs> okay. Are there any questions about this argument? For example, one could ask, why does this fail in four dimensions? Is that clear? The main issue, so the main point is that uh, rather than one over Q squared in four dimensions, the whole thing has to have dimension four. And uh, this can be a logarithm. And this argument essentially doesn't lead anywhere. One finds a logarithm and not a polynomial, and that's it. But in two dimensions, it just works uh, out of the box. Sorry, this I don't want to erase. Okay, now let us study the other implication of this little analysis. So the other, implication, the other implication of this little analysis is that we can derive uh, the wild anomaly, more or less just from that. So the idea is that instead of tracing over both indices, which is what I've done before, now let us trace over just one set of the indices, mu and nu. So we find that, so we will write an equation of the following sort. We'll trace over mu and nu, and then we have, so we have theorem of q, and then t mu nu of minus q. So from this, I'm still assuming scale invariance, which we know already leads to conformal invariance. Uh, <coughs> but even though the trace of the energy momentum is zero, it does not mean that it has to be zero. Uh, it, it, totally mean, it doesn't mean that it has to be zero at coincident points. So don't be confused about that. You see that the trace of the energy momentum tensor is zero. But it doesn't mean that any correlation function that involves the trace of the energy momentum tensor is zero. It may be a polynomial in momentum, which translates in position space to a delta function in space time. So even if or when an operator vanishes, it does not mean that its correlation functions are trivial. It just means that its correlation functions are localized. They're just delta functions. So it still makes sense to study this kind of correlation functions, even though the trace of the energy momentum tensor is zero. So let's study this particular correlation function. So one finds minus b plus d, and then q mu q nu minus eta mu nu q squared. So that's what you find if you just trace over one set of the indices. <coughs> now, you can prove, so one can prove this is one of the exercises. In the notes, this is a quite elementary exercise that b plus d is, is bigger than zero in unitary theories. That's again using the riesz lida theorem, but in a different way. So this is a small thing that I want you to keep in mind, that b plus d is not zero. Uh, 
Now, using this equation, we can do the following thing. Okay. So from this two-point function uh, in the other on the other board, we can do the following computation. We can compute t mu mu, uh, the expectation value of t mu mu, but when the theory is not in flat space, rather it's in some curved space. So the metric is some g mu nu. Okay. So uh, and we'll do it just to first order in perturbation theory, <coughs> meaning when the metric is very small. It's almost flat, but not quite flat. So therefore, this two-point function would be enough. So let's do this computation. This, this will be, uh, so just lift the blackboard a little bit more. So this one-point function is given uh, by the following expression. Let me, and I'll also explain where I got it from after I write the expression. So we get d2x of uh, t mu mu. This is at zero. T mu mu at zero. Zero sigma x h rho sigma x. And the the metric is given by eta mu nu plus h mu nu, and h is small. So where where do you get this equation from? So what we want to do is we want to evaluate the one-point function of the energy momentum tensor in a space which is not flat, but just very weakly curved. When we make the space a little bit curved, that corresponds to deforming the theory by coupling the energy momentum tensor to some small metric perturbation. But since the metric perturbation is small, we can lower it from the exponent. And this is where this insertion comes from. So this is the original t mu mu. And then this insertion comes from lowering, from lowering it from the exponent because when the system is coupled to a very weak metric, it responds by uh, a theorem in the action which looks like the energy momentum tensor times the metric perturbation. And this correlation function is now evaluated in the theory in flat space when the metric is at a mu nu. So we can now use uh, our equation above. This is some delta function. This is a, z this is a vanishing operator, so the integral over x only receives contributions when x hits zero. So we can use the expression above to evaluate it. So that becomes proportional to b plus d. And then I'm plugging just the Fourier transform of that uh, of the momentum, spa momentum space expression above. And one finds d to x of a zero d sigma delta two of x and minus eta rho sigma d squared of delta 2x times h rho sigma. So this is just integration by parts. This is some derivative of a delta function. Now I'm going to do some integration by parts. And of course, a integrate. I can do the integral because it's just a delta function. And one finds the following final answer. So that's the one-point function of the energy momentum tensor uh, in some very weakly curved background. It's proportional to this combination of b plus d. Uh, and then there is some combination of derivatives that acts on the linearized metric. And this you can immediately recognize as the linearized expression for the Ricci scalar. So that's proportional to the Ricci scalar. <coughs> so this is just a derivation. Th this can be done also to non Non, this is just a, for weakly curves, weakly curved spaces, but it can be, of course, done uh, for. Uh, it can be generalized to spaces which are not necessarily weakly curved, and the final conclusion is the anomaly equation in two dimensions, which I will now write with all the right coefficients, which is that. Uh, 
and C is known as the central charge. Okay. So the choice of the energy momentum sensor, so no, notice that this equation is not the same as the equation t mu mu equals zero on that blackboard. Of course, that is true in flat space, but once you couple the theory in curved space, to curved space, the trace is no longer zero. It's proportional to the Ricci scalar. And that comes from the delta functions that were present in flat space. So the delta functions in flat space imply that in curved space, one has to have a non-zero right hand side. And that's, that's, a, that's called the trace anomaly. This is the 2D trace anomaly. In terms of these coefficients b and d, c is just b plus d. But of course, as I told you, two dimensions b and d are not really independent. There is just one invariant. So I just replaced it by c, which is the most, which is the, which is the more common notation for this one invariant. Okay. Now, there is one, int one important consequence of this equation that I will use when we discuss the entanglement entropy. So I would like to go over it now. So uh, this equation is true in curved space, and it modifies the transformation rules for the energy momentum tensor in some interesting way. So how does it go? So this is a, an argument that a, is a little bit not quite as it's presented in the books, but a, a, I think it's somehow more a, in, it's somehow more correct than the usual presentation. So let's. In two dimensions, every metric, in two dimensions, uh, every metric can be locally can be locally brought to the following form. So every metric can be locally written as d s squared e to the phi dz, dz bar. So this is, this is some, another peculiarity of, peculiarity of two dimensions that every metric is locally conformally flat because you have enough uh, coordinate changes to make any metric look like that. Okay. Now, the Ricci scalar, that one can compute the Ricci scalar and Christoffel connections associated to this metric. So let me just uh, quote the expression for the Ricci scalar for this metric. So it's, uh, you can, uh, some exercises in the notes will guide you through the details and you'll, you can reproduce these results quite easily yourself. So D and D bar denote the usual complex, uh, complex derivatives with, of, this, of this function phi. So this is the expression for the Ricci scalar. And now, the tr the now we invoke the following trick. So the energy momentum tensor is conserved, even in, cur in curved space or in flat space. So this equation is always true. This is always true. Now, uh, <coughs> we, we will use this in conjunction with this, with this result to do the following manipulation. So uh, this equation can be written in complex coordinates, which are these coordinates. So this, if we call this star, so this equation can be written explicitly in components uh, using the coordinates star. Okay, using the coordinates star. And one, finds the following equation. One finds that dz bar, so let's call it d bar, so d bar of tzz, that's uh, the first term, and then there is another term which is e to the phi dz of e to the minus phi tzz bar equals zero. So you can verify that the conservation equation in this particular complex coordinates takes this form. Now, if you are in flat space, then uh, in flat space, uh, we showed before that the trace of the energy momentum tensor is vanishing. So this is zero. And one just remains with the first term, d bar of tzz. So in flat space, this equation is, of course, very familiar to you. 
It says that in two dimensions, the energy momentum tensor is holomorphic. And that leads to the conformal group, the Levier Soro group, the infinite symmetry, and so on and so forth. Now, in curved space, what we have to do is we have to use the, tra the, the fact that this is the trace of the energy momentum tensor. So we have to use the expression for the anomaly and plug this, this rich scalar. So what we find after all of this, after all of this is that, roughly speaking, uh, well, what we find after all of this is the, fo is the following rough equation. So we, this is the first term. And then the second term is e to the phi. <coughs> and I'm plugging, I'm plugging that. So one finds this goes away. So one finds something of the following very rough form. D, D, D bar of, a, of a, something like phi. This is very rough. You can plug off, you can do it yourself much more carefully at home. And so what I want to say is that uh, because the energy, this is locally the derivative of something. So the energy momentum tensor is given by the rich scalar, which is the Laplacian of some function. So if you plug that here, you can move the derivatives around a little bit and you can pull out a d bar out of the whole equation. So what one finds is that there is a new energy momentum tensor that one can define, which we'll call TZZ prime, which is not the energy momentum tensor that you derive from the action by taking derivatives. It's a new energy momentum tensor, which is given by the previous energy momentum tensor plus some coefficient times the central charge C. So there will be some central charge C here. Minus d phi squared, where phi is this uh, co metric component, plus d squared phi, with a factor of two. So this uh, new energy momentum tensor is holomorphic. That's its claim to fame. So t prime is holomorphic. So you see that even though in curved space it would seem that you need to give up on the holomorphic property of the energy momentum tensor, you can save it by modifying the energy momentum tensor by some piece. Okay, so the claim to fame is that T prime is holomorphic, but this comes with a price. T prime is holomorphic, but it's non-covariant. Why is it not covariant? If you make a coordinate change, let's say Z going to F of Z, suppose you make a coordinate change, Z going to F of Z, then phi shifts by log of the derivative <coughs> of F. And while the previous energy momentum tensor was covariant, it transformed nicely because we shifted, T prime is shifted with respect to the original energy momentum tensor by some object like that, it's not covariant anymore because phi shifts inhomogeneously. So T prime is holomorphic but non-covariant. And how do you express its non-covariance? T prime under coordinate transformations, roughly speaking, picks up what's called the Schwarzschild derivative. So it's, uh, let's call this function, let's suppose that we make a change of variables z going to f of z. So under a coordinate transformation, t prime is non-covariant, it picks up the following factor, the third derivative of f over the first derivative of f uh, minus three halves, uh, the second derivative of f over the first derivative of f squared, and there is some c here the central charge C appears with some coefficient. And one sum of the exercises that you have to solve are to fix this coefficient alpha and to fix the coefficient that appears in this equation. This is all straightforward geometry. So you see that one can get, one has a holomorphic energy momentum tensor in curved space, but it's not, it's not covariant. And it shifts by something that's called the, sh something that's called the, Schwarzian, the Schwarzian derivative. So this combination of functions has very many nice properties and it's called the Schwarzian the Schwarzian derivative. This will be very important when I'll discuss some recent developments that concern with the entanglement entropy. So this is an aside comment that you need to keep in mind. Okay. Okay, let me, let me erase. 
Is there any break after one hour? It goes through, okay. You wanted to start from a theory which is in flat space? Or no, I, if I have a theory which is, I could have taken it to locally to flat space if it was also available for me. Fine. But uh, then I would expect that P would be covariant over it, but it seems like I would still have some shift in the central charge when changing coordinates. Because F is not different than one spot. That is true. So. Let me, let me try to explain. So let me just try to maybe rephrase your question. So, so what you're saying is that, what you're saying is that uh, we could start from flat space, and then we could make coordinate changes, like z going to f of z. And this Schwarzschild derivative would seem to be non-vanishing, even though the Ricci scalar vanishes. Right? That's what you're saying. Now, this, this is, of course, completely true. Uh, but it does not contradict. Uh, it does not contradict anything, because uh, t when we derive this equation, t mu equals zero, we used the, met the Minkowski metric. So we used special relativity. These coordinate changes take you somehow a little bit away from special relativity. To derive this equation, I just use special relativity. But once you, once, even once you do these coordinate changes, which are non-inertial, you somehow go away from the framework of special relativity. And it's indeed true that you get the Schwarzschild derivative. There is one physical application, for example, when you go from flat space to the cylinder. So flat space is, uh, can, be, can be transformed to the cylinder by a coordinate transformation, okay, by just foliating the circles in some funny way. And that leads to a non-trivial shift of T, which is measurable. It's called the Casimir energy. So it's an effect that has been measured in some but it's th this, der this derivation, as you see, does not assume that phi is non-zero. One, one <coughs> let me just maybe explain it in a slightly different way. So this expression for the Ricci scalar, which is given by the Laplacian of phi, would vanish if phi is given by a, a coordinate transformation from flat space. Because if you are doing a coordinate transformation from flat space, phi is very special. Phi is the product of a holomorphic function. Is a log, it's a sum of two logarithms, so the holomorphic function plus an anti-holomorphic function. So the Laplacian of that kind of thing would vanish. So R would be zero for this kind of for this class of spaces. But uh, I, strictly speaking, I did not use that. So the, the the derivation is is valid for any phi, even for the special phi's. So uh, now what I would like to do is to present some perspective on this C. So you can call this uh, discussion the ubiquitous C. So this object, the central charge C, appears in many, many places in uh, two-dimensional physics. We've already seen that it appears in the Schwarzschild derivative. It appears in the trace anomaly of T mu. But those are just those are like some formal results. It actually appears in many physical measurements that you can imagine making. And uh, I'll discuss the entanglement entropy. But before that, I would like to study the partition function of a two-dimensional theory on S2. That's the, the object that I want to study now, because that will have some I mean, that can be generalized to higher dimensions, and there will be many interesting things to say about it. So the metric of the two-sphere of radius A so suppose we have a two sphere of radius a, the metric is four a squared, one plus a x squared squared dx i dx i. That's the metric of a sphere in any number of dimensions, and in particular in two dimensions, x squared would be just x one squared plus x two squared, and i would go over one and two. So in two dimensions, but it's also true in any other any num any other number of dimensions. And suppose we have a filter in flat space, and we want to study it on a two-sphere. So uh, what we want to do is to perform the pass integral uh, over some, some filter 
but now instead of flat space, we would like to study the theory on the two sphere. So this is the object that we would like to study now. So what I would like to argue is that the central, char the central charge C appears in this computation very naturally. And uh, you will see that this observation has interesting consequences for higher dimensional physics. Um, there will be interesting analogies between that and some results in three and four dimensions. So let me just convince you that this partition function is sensitive, is sensitive to this, to the central charge C. So first of all, how do we even put the theory in the sphere? So uh, the sphere, as you know, is a stereographically equivalent to flat space by the map that you've studied in school, uh, where you take some point from the North Pole and you just stretch it like this. So the sphere is conformally equivalent. The sphere is conformally equivalent to RD. So this is true for any, the d-dimensional sphere is conformally equivalent to the d-dimensional flat space. And so if you've got the conformal field theory in flat space, which is our starting point, there is a canonical procedure to put it in curved space. You just use conformal trans a conformal, because they're conformally equivalent, there is a unique procedure to place the theory in curved space. So therefore, a conformal field theory in d-dimensions uh, can be placed on it can be placed on SD canonically. So there is no ambiguity in some sense. There is a canonical preferred way of placing a field theory, a conformal field theory, flat space on the D sphere, D dimensional sphere. So let us study what happens if we vary the radius of the sphere. <coughs> so Naively, naively, you should you should you might have expected that this would be independent of the radius of the sphere, because if you have a conformal field theory, then uh, there is no preferred mass scale, so it cannot depend on the radius because there is no mass scale, and all the radius all the radii are the same; they're all conformally equivalent. So naively, if you took the logarithmic derivative with respect to the radius a of the logarithm of z, you would have expected to get zero. Uh, this is just naively, because uh, of conformal invariance, essentially. How can it know whether it's a sphere of radius one or radius two, given that, given that there is no mass scale? How can you distinguish radius one from radius two? So, but in but in reality, this is non-zero because of the trace anomaly. So let's, uh, let us do the computation. Uh, let us do the more careful computation. <coughs> and again, this is another fact about two dimensions that uh, I just need you to remember because it would be important to keep in mind when we discuss more modern and more complicated questions about higher dimensional field theory. This is just the introduction. So, the, so d over d log a of log of z, we can compute it more carefully by observing again that a small change in the metric can be understood as a coupling the theory to the energy momentum tensor. So d over d log a is given by minus s2 times the expectation value of t mu mu. So this is the key formula that if you change the sphere intuitively, it's clear. If you change the sphere a little bit, the radius of the sphere a little bit, the reaction of the system is proportional to the energy momentum tensor, it's trace, and uh, you just need to fix the numerical factors, which is uh, not, not particularly illuminating. And now we use the trace anomaly equation. So we get C over 24, square root of GR, uh, where we've used the trace anomaly equation, and that's just C over 3. Okay, so the log of the partition function on the two sphere can be now integrated 
and we see that it contains C times the log of the radius of the two sphere and to make it dimensionless you need to divide by some cut you need to multiply by some cutoff but there is a logarithmic dependence on the radius plus some kind of, okay so you see that the, that the partition function over the two sphere is not a constant number like you might have expected it to be it actually depends logarithmic, logarithmically on the radius of the sphere and the coefficient is just the central charge nothing more nothing less the, when we'll discuss tomorrow three-dimensional filters you see that this picture changes very radically and very important and it has very profound physical applications but in two dimensions that's the situation that uh, you get the logarithmic dependence on the radius which is fixed by the central charge okay this is one fact another fact that I need you to remember and finally I, I want to discuss the entanglement entropy of conformal filters so this is a subject I don't know how much background you have on so I'll try to give you an intuitive a more intuitive rather than rigorous presentation mentioned so far is essentially just a reminder of all the results that will be it's very useful that you remember everything I said for our discussion about more modern developments in three and four dimensions later and now I'm going to discuss something that is actually much newer uh, concerning the entanglement entropy of the vacuum and it's and and it can be computed in two dimensions of course and it's again going to come out proportional to the central charge in some situations so this is what I want to explain uh, again as uh, some prepar preparatory material for the discussion in higher dimensions so entanglement entropy so what's the idea uh, the intuitive idea is that uh, uh, forget about everything I've just said uh, the intuitive idea is that the vacuum in quantum filtery is something, if you read popular books about quantum filtery, then you, then you see that people are saying that the vacuum is not quite just a placid state where nothing is going on. The vacuum is a very complicated state where particles are created and they annihilate and so on. So it's a messy state in which something is going on all the time. So one would like to somehow probe the vacuum. So the entanglement entropy is some construction which allows you to learn something about the vacuum. The idea is that you take, uh, let's do one, we're in R2, okay? We're doing two-dimensional quantum field three, so R1 comma one. So we have the space direction and then there is time. Okay, and let's say that we take time to be zero. So this is the space direction when time is zero. So the vacuum is supposed to be some very complicated state and we would like somehow to probe what's going on in the vacuum of quantum filtery. Uh, to somehow put flesh on the bones of the statement that the vacuum is non-trivial. And indeed we'll see that it's very non-trivial. So one, the idea of the entanglement entropy is the following, that you will take some, you'll divide this line X into two regions, let's say an interval and its complement but you can do it more generally. You can divide it into any two complementary regions. So you'll write R, so in general you would write R equals A un union with the complement of A. Okay, you divide it into arbitrary two regions. It can be an interval which starts at A and ends at B, but it can be also a union of these joint intervals and its complement. And the idea is that you would somehow try to see how does the density matrix in this region look like. So the density matrix in the whole space is trivial. It's just a vacuum times vacuum. 
So the full density matrix is a pure state, is that of a pure state. How do you know that this is a pure state? You just square it and you see that it's, that it's uh, idempotent. But the, the, the density matrix may be non-trivial if you restrict to some subset of the points on the real line. Okay, so let's say that we want to compute the density matrix associated to the region A, which is an interval, but it can be anything. In this case, it's an interval, but it can be anything. So the idea is that you trace the density matrix of R over the complement of A. So you try to forget about everything that is outside of A by tracing the density matrix. This density matrix would not be of a pure state anymore. It would be a highly mixed state. One mixed state that you know is the thermal state, but it doesn't have to be a thermal state. It can be much more complicated. Okay. In general, it, can, it will be much more complicated than a thermal state. Okay, now one can define various interesting observables. Uh, well, maybe calling them observables is too much because it's not completely clear to me how to measure them, but people are discussing them in condensed matter physics very vigorously. So I assume somebody has some idea how to measure them. It, it's very easy to measure them in Monte Carlo on, on the lattice. So w one can say that this is an experiment in some sense. These are called the rainy entropies. Okay, one takes the density matrix and traces it over A with some power n and divides by n minus one. Okay, this is some class of ob class of uh, object class of numbers that you get by taking the density matrix over this uh, region A, which could, can be an interval or it can be more complicated, and you just uh, trace it to some power. Now, the limit of n going to one is a little bit subtle. You see, well, it, it's only defined for n, which is an integer bigger than one. All right, this is strictly speaking when it's defined. But one can hope that there is a useful analytic continuation to any n. And in particular, one can study the limit of n going to 1 of Sn. And that would be just the von Neumann entropy. That's the definition of the von Neumann entropy. Well, one uh, may need to, this is, uh, let me just uh, be more precise. I, I, I want to be slightly more precise. Uh, this equation is not completely correct. I just want it to be a little bit more precise. So the von Neumann entropy So Neumann entropy is given by the trace over A of rho log rho. And that is given by the derivative with respect to N of a trace rho A to the power N. So and at N equals one. Okay, this is the more correct equation, but you see that it's very it's basically this. The N going to one limit of that. So these are some interesting objects that you can study, given uh, any system. It doesn't have to be a conformal field theory, in fact. And uh, it's extremely challenging to compute them. And it's also experimentally relevant. There are many simulations in which these objects are computed on the lattice. And perhaps they can even, even be measured experimentally. And uh, it's, very, it's a very relevant and burning and hot question in quantum field theory and general fundamental physics to try to understand how these objects behave. And whether, even to understand whether this analytic continuation exists is an interesting question. So here I need to put some uh, place, there is some placeholder that uh, needs to say something like, if the analytic continuation exists. Maybe I'll point, I just want to say that there are, some, there are some computations in which it's not even clear how to analytically continue 
to n going to 1 and compute the von Neumann entropy. But the Rayleigh entropies exist. The von Neumann entropy is more subtle, but the Rayleigh entropies exist. Okay, so how do we compute them? So what, I, what I'm going to show you is that the, these objects can be computed in two-dimensional conformal field theory, and we have a closed form for the expression, and it's an interesting closed form. They all depend just on the central charge if A is sufficiently simple. So from now on, I'm going to take A to be just A. Okay, I'll do it just a little bit later. So how do we compute the Rayleigh entropies? to compute the Rayleigh entropies. Uh, the idea is that once you know all the, all the Rayleigh entropies, you could analytically continue to n going to 1 and extract the von Neumann entropy. So how do we compute the Rayleigh entropies? So you imagine this interval, and let's say that uh, we have uh, that A consists of some disjoint union of intervals, just for simplicity. So we have this, inter this thingy, and we want to compute trace of A of rho A to the power n. So there is a path integral, uh, a path integral that computes exactly this. How does it work? So we have some, suppose we have some field, a quantum field, phi of x. And usually we pass integrate over the full quantum field, all its configurations in R2, in R1, 1, 1, in R1, 1, okay? So we integrate over all the possible configurations of phi x and t. So it's phi of x and t. This is x and t is here. So usually we integrate over all the possible, like Feynman instructed us, all the possible configurations of the field. Now, there are these defects, there are these intervals where you don't want to integrate over. You want to keep the information about these intervals, but you want to forget about everything that's outside because you want to trace over everything that's outside. So the idea is that you integrate over all the fields phi such that if you are outside of the region A, there are just continuous functions. But if you are inside the region A, then you need to be much more careful. Okay, that's the basic idea, that you can somehow invent a modified path integral in which you integrate over all the phi's that are here, more or less as if you didn't have any, any, any defects. And when there is the defect, you need to be much more careful. So that's the basic idea, that you can come up with a path integral representation for the Rayleigh entropy. Okay. Specifically, if you want to compute a density matrix, how would you do that? So to compute a density matrix, so we need, let's compute a density matrix before we trace over it. So that's the simplest, that, that's the fundamental object that you want to compute. So the density matrix depends on some states, right? It's a big matrix in some huge space, which is the Hilbert space inside these intervals. So let's say that you want to compute a density matrix some, uh, some element of the density matrix where uh, you take one, one function f of x in A and g of x in A. So the Hilbert space A consists of essentially functions of uh, uh, functions on A. Okay, this is the Hilbert space, all the possible functions of, uh, on A. And the density matrix, for example, for f and g, has the following path integral representation. So we take a functional integral over all the quantum fields, e to the minus d action, but there are interesting boundary conditions for phi. So if x is not in A, if x is not in A, then what we do is that we just, glue, we just make the function continuous. So x t minus epsilon is equal to phi x t plus epsilon. This is what I told you before. So if you are outside of the region A, it's as if nothing is going on. If x is in A, you need to, be you, you need to make sure that phi approaches f a little bit below the interval, and it approaches g a little bit above the interval. 
So phi of x t minus epsilon would be f. And phi of x t plus epsilon is g. Okay, so this is a very complicated fast integral, but uh, we can write it down formally. So is this clear, this fast integral formulation? This is not the old stuff that you might have read in books anymore, so if there are any questions, this would be a good time to stop me. Okay, so this is a very complicated fast integral, but of course it's very ambitious. It would allow you to compute the density matrix completely for any two entries in the Hilbert space, F and G. And then you could trace, you could have lots of fun. Once, if you knew the full density matrix, you could do whatever you want. Sure. So is that how you define your Hilbert space in A complement? Yes, so the, full so the full Hilbert space in R is just a, the full set of functions of R. Okay, because we can, we, can, we can imagine that we have operators that create. So what's the Hilbert space in quantum field theory? If, I mean, the full Hilbert space is just all the functions of X. For example, we could imagine an operator that creates a field which is a delta function. It's like in quantum mechanics that the Hilbert space can be viewed as the collection of all, all, the, all, this, all these guys. So we have all the functions. And now the Hilbert space of A is just all the, func all the functions that depend on A. And you trace over everything else. So this is like computing the density matrix in the basis. So this would be like computing in quantum mechanics, that would be like computing rho x x prime. The density matrix in the basis of some cat vectors. Okay. But of course, this is a very ambitious object, object to try to compute, and it's a very complicated pass integral. The Rainy entropies are nice because they, they're actually simpler. So they have a nicer geometric interpretation. So how do we, how do we, how do we see that? Yes? Oh, I, f I thought it's two hours, sorry. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we can continue from here. We'll continue today. Okay, thanks.